Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor being back in Riyadh. I've come to this country many times that have seen uh, the economic changes and social changes occurring, reforms and so on. So it's great to be back here. Uh, thanks very much to Mazik uh, for inviting me to this great forum. And I'll present, uh, as was pointed out, a different view from the one of Alex about uh, digital currencies and digital assets. I've been a skeptic uh, of this entire space and I'll tell you why I'm a skeptic. Now, the topic today in the title of this uh, uh, conference is uh, digital currencies, uh, the road ahead. And therefore, the first question you have to ask yourself is when you're talking about uh, digital currencies or uh, cryptocurrencies, starting with Bitcoin, but there are hundreds if not thousands of other ones, uh, is whether they are currencies, whether they are money. I'm an economist, uh, like a few other people here, and uh, when people talk about money, they talk about something that is a unit of account, is a means of payment, is a stable store of value, is a single numerator. And I would say that by that definition, none of these assets, not Bitcoin, none of the other one, is a currency. Pretty much none of them is used as a unit of account. There is nothing priced in Bitcoin or anything else. There may be some exception, but really exceptions. So it's not uh, a unit of account. It's not a scalable means of payment. With the proof of work technology of Bitcoin, you can make five to seven transactions per second. With the Visa network, you can make uh, 50,000 transactions per second. When people talk about store of value, there are two ways of thinking about store of value. Store of value is something that is a stable relative an index of goods and services, so you can use it in that form, or stable store of value relative to your wealth. Now, the volatility of Bitcoin or any other uh, uh, cryptocurrency is so much that nobody is using it as a store of value or unit of account for transactions, goods and services. You know, that's why even at crypto conferences, they don't even accept Bitcoin as paying for the conference fee because the entire profit margin of that uh, seller of a merchant will be wiped out overnight if the value of Bitcoin goes down by 10, 20%. So it's not a stable store of value relative to an index of prices of goods and services. And it's not a stable store of value relative to also preservation of wealth. Uh, between November and right now, uh, at the extreme, Bitcoin was down 55% and that was the best. The other top 20 cryptocurrencies were down between 60% and 85%. This is speaking about between November and January of this year. This is the degree of volatility, much more than you have relative to anything else. And finally, it's not a single numerator either. There are thousands and thousands of these tokens. Uh, if I need to buy a Pepsi Cola with a Pepsi token, and I have to buy Coca Cola with a Coca token. I don't even know what's the relative price of goods and services. That's why we need a single numerator in a society. I mean, even the Flintstones, those of you who remember that cartoon uh, about people in the Stone Age, had a more sophisticated financial system than Bitcoin because they had a single numerator. They were using shells and they could tell the relative price of bread relative to beef. Well, in the world of tokenization, it's total chaos. It's like going back to barter, literally. This is not money, it's barter. So, you can say anything about them, they are not currencies. Second point I'll make is that people talk about digital currencies, uh, but most of money for the last few decades has been digital. Your bank deposits are digital, your wine transfers are digital. Every expression of money, with exception of one of them, cash, banknotes and coin, is digital. So we've had digital currencies in the banking system forever, and therefore there is nothing special about digital currencies. What is special, regard, supposedly, about these uh, cryptocurrencies that are based on blockchain, that are based on DLT. And then the question is whether that's a better technology or not, and I'll get to that point. Second observation here is the following one. If we're speaking about payment systems in the fintech world, and the 99% of fintech has nothing to do with blockchain, has nothing to do with crypto. There are solutions that are alternative to traditional commercial banks' deposits, their means of payment, that are widely used around the world. Billions of people make billions of transactions every day in China by using Alipay and WeChat Pay, in, uh, in India by using UPI-based system, as the government was just telling us, in Pakistan using this RAS system, in uh, 
Kenya, Sub-Saharan Africa, you have M-Pesa. In the United States, you have Venmo, PayPal, and uh, uh, Square, and tons of other ones. So the point is there is already a revolution in financial services. It's completely changing payment system, but there's nothing to do with blockchain. There's nothing to do with crypto. and allows you scalability, something that doesn't exist into these things. And it was pointed out by the two governors, there are plenty of digital banks. Again, have nothing to do with crypto, have nothing to do with blockchain. So there is a revolution in financial services. It doesn't mean that you have to have legacy financial system. There's a huge amount of innovation. The question is whether the future of finance is crypto, is DeFi or not. And I'm going to get back to that point. And my view is not going to be DeFi, it's not going to be crypto. Second observation, third observation here is the following one. So we've established that these are not cryptocurrencies. Are they crypto assets? Now, if I think about an asset, usually I think about something that either gives me an income or gives me some use or gives me some utility or gives me some store of value. For example, stocks, bonds, loans, and real estate. One gives me dividend, the other one gives me some interest on the loan, another one gives me a coupon on the bond, and real estate gives me some rent. Uh, if I own my own house, Housing is an asset, gives me housing services. Of course, commodity, all energy and all the other ones are used in tons of different ways. Now, historically, gold uh, doesn't have income, like most commodities, but it has a utility, has been used as jewelry for thousands of years. It has use, uses of industry, using gold, silver, other precious metals, and has been for thousands of years a relatively stable store of value against political, geopolitical risk, inflation, deflation, and lots of other types of financial risk of one sort or another. Now, let's take Bitcoin, that is the most popular among these crypto assets, not the currency. Doesn't have any income, doesn't have any uh, services or use. As I said, doesn't provide you liquidity or means of payment services. Uh, doesn't need has any use. It's not like jewelry. I mean, some people wear those tacky, kind of Bitcoin jewels, but uh, it's an exception rather than the rule. And as we pointed out, it's not even a stable store of value. You know, there was a bubble in tulips in the 17th century, but at least tulips have some value. Even today, Netherlands exports billions of dollars of these flowers. So flowers have value. They're precious to us and so on. The case of Bitcoin, you don't even have that type of a use. So it's highly volatile, by the way. People say it's a hedge against the risk-off episode. Totally false. Uh, look at the last episode occurred during the last month, or look at what happened last year. Every time the stock market falls by 5-10% a correction, like the Nasdaq, that is quite volatile tech growth stocks, but how much do these crypto assets go down in value? 50 to 90%. That's what happened in the last three months. Same thing happened last year. So they're not a hedge against risk off. They're not uncorrelated, they're actually more correlated with risk off than traditional assets. And they're not even a hedge against inflation. Yeah, there is worries about inflation around the world, but the rise in the value of Bitcoin is not explained as a hedge against inflation. And there are plenty of other assets, like short-term treasuries, uh, tips, inflation index bond, gold, commodities, real estate that are actually historically a much better hedge against inflation. So the alleged benefits of these things as assets or as a hedge against something do not exist either. An additional point that is slightly technical but is important, Vitalik Buterin, that was the co-creator of Ethereum, once spoke about the inconsistent trinity in blockchain. He says, in blockchain, you cannot have at the same time an asset that is scalable, that is secure, and is decentralized. Ideally, you like all three of them. You can have two out of three, but not all three of them. If you look at the legacy traditional financial systems, they are centralized, absolutely. They're not decentralized, the banks and all the other parts of the financial system but they are scalable. You can do thousands of transactions per second or billions of them over a day, and they're secure. You know, lots of times has happened to me, somebody steals my credit card information, I make a phone call, they block the account, they repay me in full, guaranteed. Same thing with my money in a deposit. That's a huge advantage of having that type of security. So are they hacking, are they cracking? Yes, but I'm safe with it. I know that my money and my investment is gonna be kept in a safe place. In the case of crypto, First of all, it's not scalable. As I pointed out, seven transactions per second, proof of work. And the other alternatives are not yet proved to be reliable. It's not secure. 
You lose your private key, your money is gone forever. There is a crypto robbery, your money is gone forever. There is a 51% attack, the money is gone forever. Literally every single day, there is a story coming out of an attack or a hack or something, and hundreds of billions of dollars, billions of dollars are gone for good. It's not secure. They say it's decentralized, but it's not decentralized either. In the mining industry, is an oligopoly of a few number of actually miners. Some of them actually in jurisdictions that they have any rule of law, like Russia or Belarus or China, to give an example. You have centralization of exchanges. Until recently, most of the uh, transactions occurred on centralized exchanges, like Coinbase and other ones. You have a centralization of developers that are judge, police, and prosecutor at the same time. Buterin was called the benevolent dictator for life of crypto. And there is massive centralization of wealth. A study suggested that the Gini coefficient of inequality for crypto at 0.86 is greater than the one of North Korea, where Kim Un Jung and his own family and cronies control most of the country. In North Korea, the Gini coefficient is 0.84. In crypto and Bitcoin, is 0.86. So there is a lot of talk about decentralization, but actually it's a totally centralized system with a bunch of insiders and whales who control most of the exchanges, most of the mining, most of the wealth, most of the development. Alex was talking about a second digital age. Yeah, we might be in a second digital age, but that second digital age may have nothing to do with crypto, may have nothing to do with uh, Bitcoin, may have nothing to do with blockchain. Why do I say that? Let me take the example of fintech because there is a revolution in financial services that is fintech. Has anything to do with cryptocurrencies or blockchain? 99.9% .9 of fintech terms have nothing to do with that. What are they based to? They're based on using AI and machine learning on one side, two IoTs and sensors that allowed you to collect big data and huge amount of information, and three, 5G and other technology allow you then to make instantaneously decisions. Like you give your information in 60 seconds, some lending platform is gonna give you an amount of a loan for a certain interest rate. You just give your information and that's what it does. So it's AI, it's big data, it's IO2 and 5G, and it's totally centralized. It's revolutionizing, as I pointed out, payment system, as I pointed out, from Alipay to Venmo to PayPal to UPI system to M-Pesa to what's happening in Pakistan. It's revolutionizing lending. It's revolutionizing insurance. It's revolutionizing asset management with robo-advisors. It's going to revolutionize also capital market activities. That's the revolution in financial services. Alex was showing you a chart before where DeFi was big like this and FinTech was this small like this. Today, it's just the opposite. 99% of the innovations in financial industry are fintech that have nothing to do with blockchain, and 0.1% at best of it is fintech. So that chart was just the opposite. Maybe it's wishful thinking about the future, but it's a, today is the opposite of what you were saying. It's not DeFi eclipsing fintech, it's fintech that has been eclipsed DeFi by an order of magnitude. That's the reality. What is DeFi? There's a lot of talk about DeFi, but the reality of DeFi, as a number of regulators pointed out, it is based on total regulatory arbitrage. Regulated financial institutions, even FinTech, have a whole bunch of regulation and supervision, have a whole bunch of compliance costs, have a whole bunch of AML, KYC. So essentially, you're doing regulatory arbitrage. By doing that, by the way, you're inducing other financial institutions that are regulated to take too much risk. That's one of the side conditions, like it happened during the global financial crisis where unregulated mortgage institutions were lending and competing against banks, creating systemic risk. And by the way, people talk about the system that is decentralized, where there is no financial intermediary. That's false too. You have effectively institutional individuals that created this uncore DeFi platform that make a fortune they make money, they make lots of profits through token or otherwise based on this thing. So they claim to be disintermediating everything. They claim there is no financial intermediation. That's false. And that's why they're going to be all eventually regulated. Regulators are not stupid to claim that this is DeFi. There is no intermediation. There is intermediation. Okay? 
and the lending that occurs in this system of DeFi, there's no lending to real economic activity. There is no lending in mortgages, all lending for buying other crypto assets and cryptocurrency. It's like an ecosystem that is self-financing itself. So far, those are the only application of DeFi. There is no real financial service provision to real world activity. So much for DeFi. And as I said, FinTech, the decentralized, is dominating financial innovation. Let me talk briefly about central bank digital currency, CBDCs. As was pointed out before, there are two models, one wholesale, but if it's wholesale, it's not very different from the current system where only commercial banks have access to the balance sheet and account with the central bank, or if you want to really have a CBDC, it has to be retail. So in the current system, as I pointed out, only commercial banks have an account with a central bank, while if you had a true CBDC, Every individual, every non-financial corporation, every non-profit, every institution will have a central bank uh, account. So that will be a revolution in the payment system. Be a revolution in the payment system because, of course, and that's one of the concerns of the central bank, is disintermediation of the traditional banking system if you have a CBDC. The traditional banking model is one of a fractional reserve banking system where there is maturity transformation. The banks are taking deposits that are short-term, they're keeping only a small fraction of liquid assets as a buffer, but most of it is lent in long-term assets, maybe loans to corporation, maybe mortgages and other things of that sort. If you had a CBDC that is retail, and it was totally free, costless, instant clearing and settlement, you have a risk that essentially every deposit in the banking system moves to the CBDC, and then the banks effectively collapse. So in that financial model, you have only one narrow bank, and the narrow bank is the central bank. And then the financial institution, instead of being traditional fractional reserve commercial banks, they have to become a loanable fund institution that borrow long term to make long term investments. And by the way, some people believe that that financial system will be more stable with less credit bubble, less financial crisis than the current one. But so far, nobody has gone in that direction so far. But that's one question. The second question, of course, with the risk of a CBDC, is the question of what's happening when there is a banking crisis and there is a run. If the CBDC is safer, then there is a risk that people take their money out of the banking system and they put in the CBDC and then that accelerates the run against the banks. I think that every central bank that has discussed the idea of a CBDC knows about these concerns about the risk of disintermediation of the banking system and risk of a run, and there are a whole bunch of solutions to these types of problems. You can limit the size of the CBDC accounts, for example, or you can have essentially MAL and KYC done by the banks, or you can have a situation in which uh, the account is not directly with the central bank, but is your commercial bank that is an intermediary between you and the central bank and things of that sort. And of course, issues of privacy and anonymity can also be resolved uh, one way or another. Now, the supporters of crypto get all excited when central banks talk about CBDC and they say, you see, even central banks are going to crypto, even central banks are going to DLT. But the reality is that all the central banks that have been looking at the idea of CBDC, they're not going to have it on a traditional blockchain, where a traditional blockchain is public, is permissionless, is decentralized, and is based on a trustless verification. All the central banks were thinking about putting these things on a technology, I think about putting it on something that is going to be private, that is going to be centralized, that is going to be permissioned, where a bunch of trusted authority, the central banks and the commercial banks, and you may meet, are going to be verifying the transactions. So it's not going to be blockchain-based, it's blockchain in name only. So we're not in a crypto world when central banks are talking about uh, central bank digital currencies. Now, one variant of the idea is, of course, the one of private stable coins that are essentially pegged to a currency, say to the US dollar. There are a bunch of them out there, Tether, USDC, and so on. They're growing, but first of all, many of them, the initial generation disappeared. They were not fully collateralized. They collapsed. They were not stable. Second question is, again, the MAL and QIC part of it. If you don't do it right, and many of them are not doing it right, like Tether, then there are serious issues about criminal using it for one reason or another. Three, the question is, if you are issuing a stable coin, but you're investing into volatile, risky assets, there is a risk that you break the buck, 
there is a run and there is financial instability. That's what happened, for example, in 2008 during the global financial crisis, when a money market fund went broke the buck because they were investing to risky assets. And then the central bank, starting with the Fed, had to backstop and guarantee even trillions of dollars of money market funds. Central banks are rightly worried about the fact that if you're taking and issuing something that says one to one to the dollar and you're investing into risky assets, you're going to cause this problem. And that's the risk of stable coins. That's why some of them are rogue, like Tether, and they're going to be cracked down on. And those who are not rogue and want to be accepted by central banks and regulators like USDC have been told, you know, you want to create a stable coin, very good. First of all, get a banking license. Secondly, you'll be a narrow bank. And three, you're going to invest everything that you are collecting into safe cash or cash-like instruments, like very short-term treasuries, so that there is no risk of a, of, a, of a run. And that means that the potential of making profit by issuing a stable coin is going to be extremely limited. Paradoxically, if a stable coin becomes actually a narrow bank that is really secure, the risk is not of instability of a bank run, but the risk is the same risk of a CBDC, that the stable coin is so stable that it disintermediates the banking system, and during the run, people are going to go to the stable coin. So essentially, if it's really safe and it's regulated the way it should be, it has the same problem of a CBDC, and those are problems that have to be addressed. Let me also talk about something broader. Alex said, this is not about cryptocurrency, it's not about Bitcoin, it's about the blockchain revolution, about the ELT revolution. And people have now realized that these cryptocurrencies are not currencies, so all the talk is about enterprise DLT or corporate blockchain. I would argue that blockchain, the way it is in these applications, is blockchain in name only. Because the blockchain or DLT technology, as I pointed out, has to be something that is public, on a public ledger, that is totally decentralized, is based on a permissionless system, and is a trustless system of verification where thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people on computer are verifying transactions. When you're looking at most applications that are in the corporate world and the private sector of DLT or blockchain, they're blockchain in name only. Why? They're private rather than public, they are centralized rather than decentralized. They are based on a permissioned system rather than permissionless. And they have a bunch of trusted validators that are proving transactions. So people talk about them as being blockchain because, of course, it's sexy to say I have a blockchain, but nothing to do with blockchain. They're like a glorified database that is permission, like Google Docs. And I'll give you an example. Recently, the CEOs of major financial institutions in the United States like the CEO of Bank of America, of Wells Fargo, of MasterCard, have said in public interviews the following way. We spent billions of dollars trying blockchain experiments. We've even done hundreds of patents in blockchain of one sort or another, but we've not yet found a single use case that is very useful, that really saves us money in terms of financial transactions. So lots of talk, very little action. There was another study 43 examples of blockchain used for non-profit because the rhetoric is we're going to bank the unbanked, we're going to financial inclusion, we're going to give financial services to the poor, we're going to give identity to the refugees, we're going to transfer money to the poor through cross-border remittances. This study suggests that out of 43 examples of using blockchain for all these non-profit activity, zero, zero of them work, zero. Final point that maybe elaborate later because we're running out of time. Trust cannot be resolved with technology alone. There is a reason why there are institutions that have a credibility and history that are used to essentially verify transactions. And the idea that technology can bypass them is totally nonsense. And I'll give you the following example. People say that in many emerging markets, starting with Latin America or even in Pakistan, uh, the problem with uh, real estate or with agriculture is that you cannot transfer your land or use it as collateral for a loan because you don't know who's owning it. And therefore, if we put everything on a blockchain, we've resolved that problem. There'll be much more financial intermediation and inclusion. But the problem with land is not the problem of technology. The problem is that every piece of land in Pakistan or in Peru or wherever, you don't know who owns it. 
Somebody might have a right for 100 years to farm on that land. Some of them uh, bring their cows, some of them to grow wheat, some of them graze it for something else. There is total chaos. And how you resolve that problem? Blockchain cannot resolve it. You need trusted individual, institution, government or otherwise, going to go to every single piece of land, millions of them, figure out who has which rights on that piece of land or not, put them on paper. And once you put them on paper, whether you put it on a centralized register like the US, where every piece of property is on a centralized register, or you put it on a DLT where you need one million computers to verify transaction, I would say the former beats the latter one because it's much cheaper. So the problem of trust cannot be resolved by technology. And the fundamental flaw of blockchain is the view that technology can resolve the problem of trust. People say we'll use blockchain for global supply chain. Same problem. I, I go and buy my organic tomatoes or fruits and vegetables at Whole Foods in New York. Some farmer says this is organic. They cannot just say it's organic, the tomato, and put it on a DLT. Somebody has to go to the farm, make sure they don't use pesticides and chemical. And once you've done that, you can say, I verified that transaction, and that's okay. Or the whole food is going to make some laboratory test to make sure there is no pesticide on the tomato. The idea you can put it on the blockchain and you resolve the problem of verifying transaction is just nonsense. So again, you need trusted individual, trusted institution that are going to verify transactions. The solution cannot be DLT. The solution cannot be blockchain. Final observations. In this world of crypto, there is a huge amount of criminality. 80% of all ICOs, and there were 17,000 of them, were a scam in the first place. Now, whenever there is a new technology, there may be a bubble. There was a bubble in the internet, but you don't have 80% of things being a scam in the first place. There are many things that failed, 80, 90% of them, but these were 80% scam. The other 10% already failed, and the other ones have lost already three quarters of their value. There's been a huge amount of market manipulation, much more than in any other asset class. Hundreds, thousands of pump and dump schemes, spoofing, wash trading, front running, conflicts of interest of many of these exchanges. Alex was talking about the risk of red flag laws. In crypto, it's the opposite. What is too much regulated is traditional financial system, while as Gary Gensler, head of ACC, said, in crypto, you have a wild west today where there is no regulation, there is no ML, there is no KYC, there is no protection of the consumer, there is nothing. So that thing about the red flag laws is just, is just actually misleading because it's, the reality is just the opposite. They're not over-regulated, they're under-regulated compared to any other one. So that was a misleading observation. So there is a debate about the future of money. There is a debate about the future of financial services. In my view, I may be proven wrong, it has to do with certainly a revolution, revolution of money, maybe central bank digital currencies, maybe, maybe private digital payment system already exists. There is a fintech revolution, there is a revolutionizing payment system, lending, insurance, asset management, pretty much everything else. But there's nothing to do with crypto and there's nothing to do with blockchain. So if you want to invest, there are already thousands of firms out there that are having revenues, that have profits, that are fintech technologies, gonna change the way we do. They're truly doing inclusion for the poor and so on. While in this world of crypto, you have a bunch of insiders, a bunch of scammers, a bunch of snake oil salesmen who are talking about inclusion, but they're actually maximizing their own profits. They're wealthy, they're concentrating their wealth, and they're just talking their own book, rather than leading to any financial inclusion. Thank you very much.